Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Frontline Club, and thank you for coming tonight. Um, I will quickly hand over to Ed Villiami, but before I do so, I'd just like to thank uh, AB Columbia for their help putting together this evening's event. And um, if I can just ask you to switch your phones to silent, and when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we are broadcasting uh, live this evening. So I'll hand over to Ed. Um, thank you for coming. Can, am I audible? So, my apologies for that. Um, look, it's not... Um, it's not... Often we get people who know the dark heart or the dark non-heart of our raw material in this institution, warfare, violence, um, quite like Jeanette Medoya. Um, I don't like the word victim, I don't like the word suffering, it's at all too uh, inadequate. But in terms of courage and endurance and experience, there's really nobody, I don't think, has been in this room who knows what Jeanette. Our subject really is warfare and the violation of women, systematic, in the words of the report that we are promoting tonight, which I urge you to read, please, and distribute habitual, extensive, and systematic violation in ways that beggar belief, let alone imagination, in Colombia, and as our discussion will take us, I think, perhaps beyond Colombia. And I'd like to try to get beyond warfare action into this dreadful society that we are becoming. Um, there's no point in a summary. Uh, Jeanette was kidnapped twice uh, by both, well, two of the three warring or armed factions in Colombia the supposedly Marxist FARC, and the supposedly fascistic militaries, and the supposed armed forces of the supposed government. Um, but enough of me babbling on. Um, you know, I think it's very important that we don't define you by the things that happened to you from May 2000 onwards. So let's start with, who, who, were, who were you on May the 24th, 2000? What, what were you doing? What were you up to? Okay. Eh, bueno, ante todo, gracias. Gracias y, y, y muy buenas noches eh, eh, a todos y a todas. Y, y gracias por, eh, por estar hoy aquí, porque para mí es muy especial eh, poder contarles un poco de lo que es Colombia hoy pero también de lo que soy yo, que me he convertido en la voz y el rostro de millones de mujeres violentadas en mi país. Eh, y esta noche estoy acá eh, por ellas y quiero que en mí vean el rostro y escuchen la voz de ellas. Well, thank you very much and good evening um, to all the men and women who are here. Um, thank you for allowing me to, to be here. For me, it's very, very special because it gives me an opportunity to talk about Colombia today. Um, and I consider myself to be the voice and perhaps the face of millions of women who have been violated um, in Colombia. I'm here for them. And when you see my face, I hope that you will also see the face, their faces. Ayer eh, cumplí exactamente 17 años de trabajo periodístico. Eh, empecé un... 3 de diciembre de 1996 y para responder tu pregunta eh, en ese momento era una jovencita que se quería tragar el mundo eh, era una reportera que salía a la calle a buscar historias y que tenía muchos sueños eh, que tenía muchas metas y muchas ambiciones eh, Sueños que mataron el 25 de mayo del 2000. Yesterday, um, I completed 17 years working as a journalist. Um, my first day of work was the 3rd of December 1996, and I was a young girl, young woman. Um, and in order to answer your question about what I was doing, when I was young, I wanted to absorb the whole of the world. 
I was a young reporter going out on the streets looking for stories. I had dreams and I had goals. And all of that died on the 25th of May 2000. Now, we're not here to well, no, no, um, key, but, um, recount everything. So um, I have no question, just a little bit, perhaps, to tell people on behalf of those who aren't here, as well as yourself, what kind of things happened. And also, how were you, how were you taken? By who? Bueno, Colombia es un país que eh, lleva más de 60 años eh, con un conflicto armado, eh, donde hay unos grupos de extrema izquierda que son las guerrillas, unos grupos de extrema derecha que son los paramilitares y unas fuerzas armadas eh, que alimentaron en gran parte la creación del paramilitarismo. Y en medio de, de ese conflicto que vivía Colombia, en 1997 yo empecé a hacer una investigación sobre tráfico de armamento eh, y sobre red de secuestros en Colombia. Y empecé a descubrir que en esta red estaban vinculados policías, militares e, e integrantes de los dos grupos armados. So Colombia has been suffering, has been living in an armed, internal armed conflict for over 60 years now. And there's a group of the extreme left, the guerrillas of the extreme left, and on the extreme right, the paramilitaries. And we have the armed forces, which in large part is responsible for the growth of the paramilitaries, the far-right paramilitaries. So, what was I doing? Well, in 1997, I was investigating two things. I was investigating arms trafficking, and I was investigating networks of kidnappers. Um, and I found out that in both of these businesses, politicians, um, members of the military, um, sorry, the police, members of the police, members of the, of the army, and of both of these illegal armed groups, the left and the right wing groups, were involved in these networks. In that moment, when I started the investigation, in 1999, I was victim of an attempt in which my mother died. But, however, I continued to investigate. Un mes antes del secuestro, estoy hablando de abril del año 2000, eh, en una cárcel eh, colombiana que era una de las más peligrosas del mundo y que era donde se estaba generando el tráfico de armamento, hubo una masacre de internos, de, de reclusos. Y yo eh, fui la única periodista que pudo entrar a esta cárcel a documentar qué era lo que había ocurrido. Después de que hice mis publicaciones, me empezaron a amenazar Empezaron a llegar las amenazas, empezaron a llamarme y a decirme que me quedaban dos días, que me quedaban tres días eh, y por último eh, enviaron fotocopias de mis publicaciones donde eh, resaltaban eh, los nombres de las personas a las que yo señalaba como autoras de la masacre. So this moment, um, 1999. Um, there was an attempt was made on my life in which my mother was nearly killed but I continued my investigations and then in May 2000 in April 2000 um, there was a prison riot in world's most dangerous prison um, in, in Colombia um, which was the centre of operations for the trafficking networks and the, the um, arms running networks that I was investigating I was the only journalist who was able to enter the prison to produce a report and following the report um, the publication of the report, that's when the threats began um, to arrive. Over the next two or three days, um, I received public threats, and I also received photocopies of publications of articles that I had written, in which the names of the people who I had um, indicated were responsible um, for the stories that I was writing about were underlined. When I got that sobre my hands, the periodical decided to call the police and ask for help. And I remember that the man who spoke to the police asked me what I thought was the solution to those threats. And I said, maybe I should talk to the paramilitaries. And he said, yes, do it. And that same night, I received a call from the chief of security of one of the paramilitaries diciéndome que al siguiente día podía ir a entrevistarlo y que él me iba a explicar qué era lo que estaba ocurriendo. Y 
Efectivamente, a la mañana siguiente yo llegué a la cárcel a entrevistarme con él, pero no alcancé a entrar. Mientras estaba esperando la autorización para ingresar al penal, un hombre me secuestró en la puerta de la cárcel, me apuntó con una pistola, me llevó a cuadra y media de la cárcel y allí empezó eh, un eh, largo camino del cual han pasado 13 años, 6 meses y 9 días. So, with the envelope in which the photocopies had arrived in my hand, I spoke to my newspaper and they suggested speaking to the police to ask for help from the police. So that's what we did. And I went to the police. The police officer that we spoke to said to me, well, what do you think the solution is? And I said, well, maybe to speak to the paramilitaries. And the policeman said, okay, do it. And that night I received a call from the head of security. Me, it was a kidnapping that's lasted the whole of my life because in the experience I died in the midst of, of life. So it was a long process, a long journey. They took me out of the city to a city that is neighboring, that's contiguous to the Bogota. And there they tortured me, three men raped me, and all the time I had a nine millimeter pistol held up to my head. And so, though it happened many years ago, it is still an experience that I live every day. No sé por qué circunstancia eh, no terminé desaparecida. Yo, yo sé que yo no iba a regresar. Yo, yo sé que, eh, que el objetivo de ellos era matarme. Y tal vez por la llamada de uno de mis compañeros del periódico, eh, esto permitió que la fiscalía montara un operativo para buscarme y ellos eh, me dejaron abandonada eh, en una carretera. Y desde ese momento tuve que empezar a reconstruir mi vida, a tomar la decisión de qué iba a pasar conmigo. Y, y yo tenía dos opciones, o el suicidio, que era lo que quería hacer, o el exilio, que era eh, lo que me ofrecía el Estado. Y mi decisión fue quedarme en Colombia. Mi decisión fue regresar a la redacción tan solo 15 días después del secuestro. Y regresé el 15 de junio del 2000 y, y desde ese día no he parado un solo día. Eh, creo que el renacer eh, estuvo ahí, en volver a hacer periodismo. So, the question, why? I don't know why I wasn't killed. I knew that I wasn't going to return. I knew that their aim was to, to kill me. I don't know why they didn't. Perhaps it was a call that one of my colleagues from the newspaper made to the public prosecutor's office who began um, a search and the paramilitaries found out about this and they left me um, in the road. And it was from that time um, that I have begun to, that I began to reconstruct my life. I had to decide on my future. And quite honestly, I had two options. Either I could commit suicide, which was my preferred response, or I could go into exile, which is what the state offered me. But in fact, I knew that I didn't want to leave the country. And what I did, just two weeks later, was to return to the paper. And on the 15th of June 2000, I returned to my newspaper, and since then, I've never stopped. And I think that was what allowed me my rebirth. I went back to the newspaper and carried on working as a journalist. What happened with the FARC? Tres años después de, de, de este episodio, eh, yo seguí haciendo periodismo y viajé a una zona selvática de Colombia. Y cuando llegué con el reportero gráfico que me acompañaba, eh, la guerrilla me secuestró porque no les pedí permiso para entrar a su país. Eh, estuve retenida durante ocho días al lado de mi compañero eh, en una situación muy humillante, eh, pero afortunadamente logramos que una comunidad que estaba cerca al sitio donde, donde estábamos retenidos eh, eh, hablara con el comandante del frente y, y ellos eh, nos dejaron en libertad. Indígena. Eh, una población civil. 
Um, three years after this thing happened with the paramilitaries, I continued working as a, as a journalist, um, and I was doing research on to doing investigation um, on the FARC. So I travelled to a jungle zone with a photographer, and we were kidnapped because we hadn't sought permission to enter their country, as they put it in their terms. So I was held for a week with the photographer in very humiliating circumstances. But luckily, um, members of the leader of a local community, a local rural, rural community, spoke to the front commander of the FARC. And as a result of that, who I was able to be set free. Gracias. Now, in, when, when I was in Colombia, about uh, uh, 10 months ago, uh, actually yes, working on the efficacy of the uh, land like restitution laws, which is allow mm -hmm. people to go back to land from which they did. Interviewing a couple of women. And they spoke about violation, um, not in passing, but as though it was presumed. And then I was violated. And then I was violated. And then they did it again here. And what one leads to this conclusion is a systematic, widespread, I, I can't remember the, the words there, <laughs> the, the, um, that this is um, not some byproduct of warfare. This is the quintessence of what is it, it is at the core of what is um, Can you talk a bit about that, about this great hidden, unspoken crime? horror that appears to be, if not universal, uh, almost ubiquitous, a, a ubiquitous experience, not just for reporters like you who are investigating, as you so mm -hmm. bravely and estimably were, not once but twice, um, but almost, it's part of, I hate to use the word routine, the, the experience of displacement, it, I mean, it is, it is a, it's, it's, it's a raw material of this conflict. Can you talk about it? Yo entendí la dimensión de lo que era la violencia sexual cuando, cuando lo tuve que afrontar en mi vida y en mi cuerpo. Eh, porque ya llevaba algunos años haciendo periodismo y sabía que había casos, pero no sabía la, la dimensión, no la conocía. Y el informe de AVE Colombia, eh, que es muy oportuno en este momento, habla un poco de esa dimensión y de lo que hemos logrado documentar. Y cuando, cuando yo eh, afronto en mi cuerpo eh, la violencia sexual, empiezo a buscar a otras mujeres que han pasado por lo mismo que yo pasé. Y empecé a encontrarme casos por todo el país, de mujeres que habían sido usadas por los paramilitares, pero también mujeres que habían sido esclavizadas por la guerrilla, eh, y mujeres que habían sido violentadas por las fuerzas legales del Estado. Y empezamos... Eh, a construir como una cadena o como una, una, una colcha, una, una cobija de retazos con todas estas historias. Y todas eran historias dramáticas, donde la violencia era barbárica, sobre todo en el caso de los paramilitares, y donde efectivamente el cuerpo de la mujer era usado como un arma de guerra. I didn't understand the scale or the meaning of sexual violence until I suffered it myself. I knew it existed, but not until I had experienced it in my own life and in my own body did I really understand the scale and the meaning of it. And the AB Columbia report that's been produced speaks something of the scale and also what we have done as women's organizations to document um, the scale of the, of the problem. But when I faced it as, a, as an individual, I searched out other women all around the country who had suffered similar things, who had been abused by the paramilitaries, who had been enslaved by the guerrilla groups, who had been violated or raped by the, by the armed forces. And what we began to do was to construct a quilt, a quilt with people's different um, experiences, telling the stories of, of women. And all of them were dramatic, and the stories were barbaric, especially the stories that involved um, the paramilitary groups, of what they and I had lived with our bodies as survivors of... Ten tenemos casos dramáticos de mujeres en, en poblaciones eh, rurales de Colombia que han sufrido empalamiento, que han sufrido eh, cercenación de, de sus senos, eh, que han sufrido amputaciones y que han sido cometidas como escarmiento por parte de los grupos armados, eh, en especial los paramilitares, 
para castigar supuestamente a sus enemigos o para dar un escarmiento a la población. Eh, y hasta hace dos años era un drama que no se conocía y que el mismo país no quería aceptar. We had dramatic cases in rural areas in, in Colombia where women have been beaten, where their breasts have been cut off, where they've been amputated, where, and this is especially a practice of the paramilitaries, where they've been abused and beaten in order to serve as a warning, to scare off the, the rest of the community. And the truth is that just two years ago, we didn't know, the country was really ignorant about, about the scale of, of things and the nature of the terrible things that were happening. And, but, but the... the Two years ago, and yet and it's more than two years ago, and this in a way reflects this inquiry about the efficacy of land restitution. There is this law, Auto 062, which protects women being displaced or being displaced. I mean, I mean, what you're describing is something that is universally, I mean, it's, in, it, 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 it's ubiquitous, and yet it's unspoken. I mean, how can the law work if the paramilitaries and the FARC control great tranches of territory and the armed forces who are supposed to be enforcing the law are also doing what they do? I mean, uh, uh, yo eh, siento que a, a veces, o, o, o muy seguido, estamos enviando el mensaje de que en Colombia en este momento todo es maravilloso y que todo está bien. Eh, pero no es así. Tenemos una cifra de impunidad del 98% en los casos de violencia sexual. Con el desmonte paramilitar eh, se creó la Ley de Justicia y Paz. Y dentro de esta ley hay reconocidos 150.000 casos de violaciones de mujeres y solo hay dos condenas. Esto nos demuestra que la ley no se aplica. Y para las defensoras de derechos humanos que están peleando por la restitución de tierra en estos momentos, pues hay una amenaza grande porque en, en el último año y medio hemos tenido más de 17 defensoras que han sido nuevamente víctimas de violencia sexual por denunciar y por reclamar tierras. So this is exactly the problem. Um, the law doesn't work. I often feel that the message that's being given out about Colombia is that everything's fine, everything's perfect, but it's not the case. So we in in Colombia there are the levels of impunity for crimes of, of sexual violence have reached 98%, 98% impunity for sexual violence cases. And when the paramilitaries demobilized um, in the last decade, a special law, the law of justicia y paz, justice and peace law, was passed to cover the demobilization. And uncovered as a part of this process, we found that there have been 150,000 rapes of women um, that have been recognized by the param paramilitary groups. And of those 150,000 cases, two have resulted in guilty verdicts. So the levels of impunity are just terrifying. And women human rights defenders, women human rights defenders who are um, working to defend their, their rights within the process of, of, of land return, we found that um, over the last year um, that 17 women's rights defenders have been again victims, have had, have had to suffer again from sexual violence but as a result of the, the human rights defense right. work that they're doing in defense but of their land. That's with the, with, with, with the if you like, the, the, the mm. aftermath of the, of the decommission of the paramilitaries. If we take this into the peace process with FARC, um, uh, 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 well, as so often, Northern Ireland, Mexico, Colombia, everywhere, now the women lead the peace movement while the men make war. Cliché, but true. Um, there's the situation post paramilitary. Now we go into the peace process, the talks with the FARC. Uh, at the time the report was published, there was not a single woman round the table in Havana. Mm -hmm. The indications were, I gather there are now two. The, the indications to you are that there will be an amnesty over sexual violation. How does this situation project into the peace process? Does that end up with another 150,000 rapes and only two more convictions? How can you say, look at the, the fiasco of what happened? in the wake of the supposed decommission of the paramilitaries, ha ha. Um, 
how do you take that forward to the table in Havana and then back into your society? Esa es eh, eh, una de las motivaciones que nos tiene aquí o que me tiene aquí en, 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 en Gran Bretaña y es que estamos pidiendo el respaldo de la comunidad internacional para que no sean indultados los crímenes de violencia sexual ni a las FARC ni a los integrantes de la fuerza pública en esta negociación. Porque dentro de los cinco puntos que están planteados en la mesa por ningún lado está incluido el tema de violencias contra las mujeres. Y es muy grave, es muy grave lo que ha ocurrido en medio de, de la guerra desatada eh, y sobre todo en las zonas donde las FARC eh, han hecho presencia históricamente. Pero además eh, la falta, la ausencia eh, de la mujer en, en la mesa de negociación también nos deja un vacío muy grande de qué va a pasar en el posconflicto. Porque esa va a ser la parte más dura de esta negociación, el post-conflicto. Porque habrá muchos guerrilleros que no van a entregar las armas, que seguirán amparándose en el narcotráfico y que seguramente generarán otro grupo que va a seguir eh, eh, cometiendo actos violentos contra las mujeres, eh, sobre todo en las zonas más apartadas de Colombia. Yeah. Um, this is precisely the reason why I'm in, in, in Britain. Um, because we're trying to garner support from the international um, community so that there is no amnesty for crimes of sexual violence committed by members of the FARC or by members of the armed forces. Because in the five negotiating points that are being discussed in, in Cuba, violence against women isn't mentioned once. And very, very serious, these serious events that I've been talking about um, have taken a place in regions that historically have been controlled by the FARC and it's not mentioned in the negotiating point. The absence of women also, as you mentioned, the absence of women in the negotiating table um, leads us to question, to ask serious questions about what's going to happen to women in the post-conflict period. Because many of the guerrillas will not leave, will not um, hand over their arms. They will continue um, armed and they will continue being involved in drugs trafficking, for instance, they will remain um, active and no doubt they will continue to commit acts of violence against um, against women, especially in the more distant regions, the more isolated regions. Of the this, this, in a way, we're going to open this up in about 15 well, minutes, which will give us minutes, 40 minutes, minutes for questions, if that's okay. okay. Um, which gives me 15 minutes left. I want to try and, and we, and we will have to come back to just other issues in the peace process, because that's on the flyer, people may want to know about Is this going to work or not, apart from our um, theme tonight. But just to go to, you know, the, you're here, it's to mobilize international support. But a thought occurs, I mean, of course this isn't just gold. Something's happening. Looking back to the wars that were fought, and the ghastlinesses of Vietnam, Korea, even the United States' imperialist wars in Central America. One wonders whether the violation of women was quite so prominent in Vietnam and Korea, one, in, one infers not. Bosnia, tens of thousands of women violated night after night in camps especially established for the purpose. A sort of grotesque and mind-boggling dry run for the narco war in Mexico, in Ciudad Juarez, the femicidio, mass murder abduction, mutilation, violation, manufacturing, workers, women workers. We're now hearing from Syria these, these, these um, stories about I mean, women who finally make it to the refugee camps only to find themselves abducted for enslaved sex trafficking. Um, I mean, something's going on. Uh, uh, this this sort of misogynization of, of all warfare. <laughs> Uh, I mean, in, in Colombia, you are speaking for your Colombian mujeres. But, but I mean, we could be talking about Bosnia, we could be talking about the Syrian refugee camps, we could be, could be talking about Ciudad Juarez. Congo, please. Um, something's happening. What do you think it is? Definitivamente, in todas las guerras pasa eso. En todas las guerras, eh, los cuerpos de las mujeres son usados como, como, como un arma. Y en el caso de Colombia, 
eh, durante muchas décadas las mismas mujeres creyeron que eso era algo normal, porque sus cuerpos podían ser usados para eso. Pero cuando empezamos a entender la magnitud de lo que se estaba haciendo, pero además de cómo se estaba comerciando y hoy en día cómo se sigue comerciando con las mujeres alrededor de la guerra, eh, entendemos que se volvió una industria y que se volvió un negocio para los grupos armados. Hoy, hoy que es 4 de diciembre, les puedo decir que en este momento, hoy es eh, miércoles, en este momento hay un bus que está llegando a Medellín, que es una ciudad principal de Colombia, y está recogiendo niñas de entre 12 y 16 años, y las lleva todo el fin de semana a los campamentos que se han puesto alrededor de las minas y las venden y las comercian y las explotan sexualmente durante cuatro días y luego las regresan nuevamente a Medellín. Y está ocurriendo hoy. In all wars, it's happened in Colombia for many decades. The only thing is that women thought it was something that was normal. And it was only when we began to document the way in which women's bodies um, can be used as weapons of war, when we understood the scale, that perhaps the, the focus, the, the profile increased. And it's also a business, it's a, it's a, it's a commercial opportunity for the armed groups. Let's think it's Wednesday, the 4th of December today. I can tell you that today a bus will be arriving in Medellin to round up groups of girls aged between 12 and 16, and they will be driven off to the mining camps um, outside Medellin, where they will be taken for a weekend, where their bodies will be sold, where they'll be rented out and exploited for four days, and then they'll be taken back to Medellin, having provided their services and having produced income for the armed groups. But this is crucial because, well, this is crucial. because you know, I, you know, in this place we talk about warfare, but but the, the this war doesn't seem to have any 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 boundaries in, 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 in war. Um, you talked about the mines. And in your report, I noticed that you talk about the, the, the concentration of cases of uh, where there are quote economic interests. Um, so two questions really. One is, you know, um, when you seek international support, do the countries like the US and the UK, as they pontificate about sexual abuse during the war, do they make the connections to their own mining companies and the displacement created by their mining companies and the camps to which the girls from Medellin will go? I mean, we're talking not just about warfare, but society here. That's my first point. My second one is, I mean, how deep does this go? I mean, there is a kind of porno pornographication, porno pornographication of society, viagrification, call it what you want, that has happened in the last 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, how deep does this go in those two ways? You know, this catch-all term, foreign investment, whoa, at all costs. Let's, we will have your minds, have your minds, but you've told us what it leads to. And this gun, I remember the Serbian guards you know, sitting there with polishing their guns, always TV pornography, all the time. And I don't think that was the case necessarily. So, how deep can you go with this? The mines, the, you know, the trafficking. It's happening here, a mile from this building, the same thing is happening. Less. It's not just Colombia. I mean, talk a bit more about the economic interests of the business beyond, the, beyond warfare. Sorry. Tocas dos puntos importantes, porque, porque uno es eh, efectivamente el, 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 de la, el de las multinacionales y el de la inversión extranjera. Cuando yo hice la investigación sobre lo que pasaba en las minas, fue una investigación que pueden encontrar en internet porque la publiqué en mayo pasado, eh, las grandes compañías mineras eh, que son extranjeras, pues ninguna 
tenía ni siquiera un plan eh, de prevención de violencia sexual y sabían perfectamente que alrededor de sus minas habían campamentos donde estaban explotando las niñas. Solo después de mi denuncia es que empiezan eh, a hacer planes sociales para prevenir eh, este delito. Y lo otro es que los actores de la guerra, los implicados en la guerra, los hombres que tienen el fusil eh, y que dicen que, que, que no están eh, eh, implicados en temas de violencia sexual, pues son los que más contratan mujeres, eh, que en Colombia se llaman prepagos, para que vayan a sus campamentos y les presten servicios sexuales. Y estas mujeres, en su mayoría, son menores de edad. Very important points that you're bringing up. First of all, yes, at the, at the transnationals and direct foreign investment. When I carried out my investigation into the mining industry, which is available on the internet, it was published last, last May, um, I found that the major mining companies, all of which are foreign, did, none of them had a sexual violence prevention plan, even though they knew all about the existence of the phenomenon, they knew all about the sex camps. None of them had done anything about it. It was only after my article was published that they began to, um, to implement social investment plans you know, to try to combat the situation. And in terms of the armed actors, who they say are not any longer um, involved, it is in fact they who are at the centre of the sex trade. Um, the, the paramilitaries in particular buy sex with a, girls who are called, they're called the prepaid, like prepaid cell phones. Um, the expression is the same in, in Colombia, so you prepay them and then you can use them for sex. And that's something which is very, very marked, particularly with the, with the paramilitary groups. Is that something that, you, that the, the organization is called, it's called, is it Leave My Body Out of the War or something is the name of the organization? Yeah. Super. Is that something that, 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 um, that you can do be to try and get some kind of uh, condition, if you like, on this, you know, these great foreign investors coming in, <laughs> um, that you, know, you don't get to mine our land unless you, you are seen to prevent, to take action, to prevent this grotesque uh, sub-business. Mm -hmm. Is that something you could, you could get the government to stipulate, make it part of, of, of uh, Zero Six Two? Eh, alrededor de la minería en Colombia hay todos los intereses. More serious, much more, much more profound. If we're really going to get to to the bottom um, of a question that is so apparently superficial or, or, or marginal, like the question of sexual violence. Even, even even more hidden forms of brutalization of the society in a way against women. Sí, una de las conclusiones de todo el trabajo que, que, que he venido haciendo en estos años es que eh, esa violencia no está solamente generada por el conflicto armado y es mucha más la violencia eh, eh, que se da en el hogar. El sitio más peligroso para las mujeres en Colombia es su propio hogar, pero cuando uno mira los casos, la mayoría de los casos donde las mujeres han sido violentadas los eh, hombres que cometen esta violencia de alguna manera están ligados con la violencia del país, de alguna manera eh, eh, han heredado esa violencia, entonces son hombres que son o excombatientes o que han hecho parte eh, de, alguna, de alguna banda delincuencial, eh, que hacen parte de alguna, de alguna red o que eh, de alguna manera la violencia ha tocado sus vidas. Entonces, nosotros sí creemos que esa violencia generalizada contra las mujeres en Colombia se ha derivado del proceso de violencia en sí que ha vivido Colombia. Tenemos casos lamentables de mujeres eh, en las que casas donde sus esposos las han asesinado hasta de 52 puñaladas eh, y la prensa colombiana las llama crímenes pasionales, pero son homicidios generados eh, o derivados de, de todo un tema de violencia que rodea eh, al país y, y pues que cada, cada hogar no es ajeno a esto. Yeah, um, one of the conclusions that, that I have drawn from these years of work is that violence in Colombia, violence against women, is not just the result of the conflict, 
um, many more women are victims of violence in their home. The most dangerous to be is a woman at home. It's more dangerous than outside. But the causes... Well, I think that in many ways, the, the men who are committing the acts of, of violence, in many, many cases, the majority of cases, they actually have been in some way affected um, by the situation of generalised violence that is lived in the country, um, that the country experiences. There might be ex-combatants, there might be ex or actual members, current members of criminal gangs, or some kind of um, violent network, or in some way they've been affected by um, the violence. And so I think in this way, the generalised um, situation of violence against, violence against women that we're living in the country is linked to the overall pattern of, of, of violence that is lived in the country. We have cases when, when the husband of a woman um, might be attacking the woman and, and she's, she's killed with 52 stab wounds. And the press reports this as being a, a crime of passion. But it's, it's not a crime of passion. It's a crime of extreme violence <coughs> against women. It's exactly the same in, in Mexico. Exactly Since the femicidio, then the drug war, domestic violence yeah. through the roof. Uh, we're going to have to ask just a, 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 two quick questions about the peace process itself, because we promised this mm -hmm. on the fly. Um, um, one question, two parts, in two directions. I mean, I, I um, ended up doing an interview with Don Berna's lawyer last March. Uh, accidentally, it was a um, He seemed very confident. He seemed, in, he seemed to think that he was in a more powerful position now than he was some time ago. Um, contemptuous of the commission. Um, he was waiting for the next phase. By the same token, um, FARC. Uh, people said that, in as much as there is a, a political column in FARC, there are people who want to sort of do a Sinn Féin, if you like go into mainstream politics. But what about the... Um, the IRA was not a multi-billion dollar international cocaine business. Um, uh, just your thoughts on those specific issues. I mean, the paramilitaries clearly have not decommissioned, or at least they are. <laughs> they're hiding a lot of stuff. Um, and FARC may have a political interest in, in coming in, in, in the Irish model, which has been, is being, I mean, I understand that the negotiators are talking a lot to Sinn Féin about it. Um, but what about the narcos? I mean, what's in it for them? Bueno, el, el narcotráfico sigue siendo el, el, el combustible de la guerra en Colombia. Y sabemos perfectamente que los paramilitares que no entregaron las armas, eh, no las entregaron precisamente no porque siguieran defendiendo sus ideales de extrema derecha, sino porque necesitaban afianzar su negocio de narcotráfico. Hoy son eh, los grandes aliados de los Zetas en México, eh, tienen unos nexos muy fuertes con los carteles en Centroamérica y, y son los que manejan las rutas. Y la guerrilla, por su parte, tiene unos nexos muy fuertes con el cartel de Sinaloa, eh, tienen sus negocios, entonces a estos hombres que tienen los negocios con México, con los carteles de México, pues no les interesa entregar las armas. Y lamentablemente ese va a ser eh, el gran dolor de cabeza para Colombia. Lo es en este momento con los paramilitares que no se desmovilizaron y que han generado un consumo interno de droga en Colombia, pero además un gran fenómeno de microtráfico en Colombia. Y esto se va a acrecentar, sin lugar a dudas, con la desmovilización o con la entrega eh, de armas eh, de las FARC, porque hay un sector que no lo va a hacer y que nos va a generar un problema mayor. Right, well, the drugs, the drugs is what still fuels the conflict in Colombia. We know that the paramilitaries who didn't demobilize in the, the paramilitary process, they didn't make the decision not to demobilize in order to defend their right-wing positions. They did to defend the, their financing that they get from the, the drugs trade. Um, the non-demobilized paramilitary groups are the great allies of the CETES cartel from, from Mexico and the, the drug cartels from Central America. They control all the routes, they control the routes, the drug trafficking routes up, up north. And the FARC is allied with the Cartel of Sinaloa. So, for these people, the people who are involved in, in that part of the, the armed groups, there's absolutely no interest in, 
in, in abandoning their, their weapons. And this, of course, is creating, will create um, a, a headache, was the expression, a problem for, for, for Colombia. Um, because Ese periodismo me, me enamoré de esto y, y, y dicen que el amor lo puede todo y, y, y en mi caso el amor por el periodismo lo ha podido todo. Eh, pero más allá de eso yo creo que las ganas de buscar mi verdad, la verdad de lo que le pasó a Ginés Bedoya. Yo eh, espero que el día eh, que definitivamente me, me vaya de este mundo eh, yo tenga la certeza de, de qué fue lo que pasó. ¿Por qué pasó? ¿Por qué me persiguieron a mí y a muchos de mis colegas? Y yo pasado mañana regreso a Colombia, eh, regreso a la realidad, porque aquí he estado en libertad. He podido eh, caminar por la calle, he podido estar en un restaurante sin que me vigilen y pasado mañana mi vida vuelve a estar reducida en un carro blindado y con muchos guardaespaldas. Eh, pero asumí eso, eh, fue mi decisión de vida y, y yo creo que no me he equivocado. Yo espero no estar equivocada. Uh, that's a difficult answer. Um, how did I overcome my, my fear when it looked as if my, my life was over? How did I continue as a, both as a woman and as a journalist when I was faced by this black wall and it looked like it was going to be impossible to, to drag my way out. Well, I believe that as a journalist, I fell in love with the profession from the first day that I started it. And they say love conquers all. So I think that's um, a part of the, the explanation. But also I had a, a need to know what had happened, what had happened to Jeanette Bedoya. So that when I leave this world, when I of my mortal coil, I will know what happened. Why me? Why to me? Why to my colleagues? Because I am confident that this will be, I need to, to discover what it was that, that happened and why. Now, the day after tomorrow, I'm, I'm returning to Colombia. Um, here, while I've been in the UK, I've been free to walk the streets. I've been free to go to restaurants, happy in the knowledge that no one's looking at me, that no one's that no one's observing me. But when I go back, I'll um, be greeted by my bulletproof car and a large number of, of bodyguards. Um, and that's the reality that I'm going to go back to. Um, but that's my life. That's what I've chosen. And it's the way I want to is, carry on living. Is there, is there not something else, though? I hate to ask this, but uh, the bulletproof car, the threats, but also this sort of... Um, the politicians have their palaces, paramilitaries have their guns, one sometimes feels they can just go, ah, oh, she's off again. I mean, I mean, I'm speaking almost out of my, myself here, as well as a journalist. I fell in love with the same profession. You sometimes think, like you can hear them yawning. It's almost as bad as the bulletproof car. Lo peor que me podía pasar en la vida ya me pasó. Yo creo que no hay nada peor que, como mujer, ser humillada y ultrajada de la forma en que yo fui humillada y ultrajada. Eh, en este momento sigo amenazada. Eh, yo sé que salgo de mi casa en la mañana, pero no sé si voy a volver en la noche. Y yo digo, ¿qué es lo peor que puede pasar después de esto? Y, y lo peor es la muerte. Y, y yo ya estoy preparada para eso. Pero tal vez hay algo peor que puede pasar. Y es salir de Colombia sin deberle nada a nadie. Eh, yo lo he dicho muchas veces y lo quiero repetir hoy acá. Yo prefiero morirme de un balazo en Colombia a morirme de tristeza en una pieza en el exilio en Europa o en Estados Unidos. No, no es conmigo. El exilio no existe en mi lenguaje. No. Claro. No. The worst that could have happened to me in my life has already happened. <coughs> There's nothing that can be worse than to be, as a woman, than to be humiliated and outraged 
in the way that I was humiliated and outraged. And I still live under threats. I've still got many threats hanging over me. I know that when I leave the house in the morning, I may not come back um, in the afternoon. But what's the worst they can do to me? Kill me. And I'm prepared for that. For me, it's worse to leave Colombia not owing anything to anyone. Es muy difícil que, que, que en este punto eh, primero pase la legalización de la droga porque bueno, el gobierno colombiano siempre ha estado en contra, pero además eh, desde el año 2002, desde el 2001, la guerrilla eh, presentó todo un plan eh, para socializar el tema de la droga en las regiones colombianas y lo están planteando nuevamente en este momento en La Habana y es eh, cómo volver eh, algo productivo eh, todo el tema de, del, del cultivo de coca sin que sea algo legal. Es, es un modelo muy extraño, pero creo que ellos son los únicos que lo entienden. Eh, pero sin lugar a dudas no hay una salida efectiva que te diga el narcotráfico va a terminar, porque los consumidores siguen aquí en la calle de Londres en todas las calles de Londres, y siguen en Ámsterdam, y siguen en Nueva York, y siguen en Los Ángeles. Y mientras haya mercado, mientras haya demanda, narcotráfico va a haber. Entonces, la solución no va a estar en La Habana, definitivamente. Bueno, es muy difícil, es muy imposible que haya ninguna legalización. El gobierno de Colombia siempre ha sido against it, it's just not going to happen, really. it's not on the cards. Um, but also, since, about two th since 2001, the guerrilla, in 2001, the guerrilla published a plan, um, a discussion document, which they've been discussing in the, in the regions in Colombia on, on the drugs question. And now, in the discussions in Havana, they kind of um, brought it up again, with a, a plan that probably only they understand, a complicated plan about how to continue profiting from drug production without legalizing it. Um, mm. This is going to be discussed in Havana, but what is certain is that drugs trafficking, narco-trafficking is, <coughs> is not going to finish because the demand's not going to finish. People on every street corner in London, Amsterdam, New York, Los Angeles are still consuming, so while there's still a demand, for it, there's not going to be an end to, to drugs trafficking. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Loud and clear. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I want to say thank you very much too. I agree that it's a real privilege to hear you speaking. So thank you for you know being so honest. Um, in this country, we've heard a lot of stories at the moment about Colombia in a more positive light. There's a big exhibition at the moment at the British Museum that's been done in conjunction with the Musée de Loro from in Bogota. And also it's being promoted very much as a tourist destination. And I understand that the government is very much pushing that. Do you feel that they're using that as a distraction to kind of push the other problems under the carpet? Or do you think it's actually very positive for Colombia that we should also be talking about things that are more optimistic? Yo creo que obviamente para, 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 para cualquier eh, persona del mundo eh, siempre va a ser positivo que se hable bien de su país. Y yo amo mi país. Y qué más quisiera eh, eh, que llegara mucha gente a conocerlo y a conocer la parte buena de Colombia, porque tenemos, estoy segura, muchas más cosas buenas que malas. Lo que no podemos hacer es eh, permitir que haya una cortina de humo frente a las realidades del país. Porque si bien es cierto que hemos mejorado, eh, si bien es cierto que se han implementado unas políticas para tratar de sacar el país adelante, seguimos teniendo problemas y no los podemos meter debajo del, del tapete. Eh, Medellín es eh, la ciudad innovadora del mundo, pero es la ciudad innovadora del sector donde está la gente que tiene la plata. Pero si tú vas a 15 minutos de esa ciudad innovadora, están las comunas, donde niños de 10 años tienen pistolas en su cintura. Eso no puede ser innovador y no lo podemos ocultar. Pero tampoco quiere decir que no querramos que la gente vaya y conozca Medellín. Obviamente, todo el mundo quiere escuchar a las personas hablar bien de su país. 
of their country. And I want to hear people speak well of, of my country. I love Colombia. I'm Colombian. I love Colombia. And I want you to come and get to know the good things about Colombia. I'd love you to come. And I'm sure that there are more good things than there are bad things about the country as well. But we can't allow that to happen behind a smokescreen that tries to cover up or hide the bad things um, that are happening. We have policies, positive policies that have been put in place. But the problems continue and it is wrong to try and sweep um, the serious problems that we have under the carpet and pretend that they don't exist. Medellin has just been named as the innovation city of the world, the international innovation city, most innovatory city. And that's true. It is for the people who've got the money to enjoy it. But just 15 minutes away from the the beautiful innovatory centre of Medellin, are ten-year-old children in the comunas, in the poor parts, who are packing a pistol. Great translation. He's, he's amazing. He's perfect. <laughs> Hi. Um, quick question. Yeah, you say, but maybe this is temporary, but at the moment you're traveling in a um, bulletproof car, being down and everything. And I'm sure you hope that is temporary. Does that affect your ability to carry out effective journalism at the moment? Um, or, it seems like you're a bit confined to the same fate as the Santo Domingo family or the one of the richest who can't travel anywhere in the country without heavy amounts of security, which I imagine is very frustrating. Um, voy, a, voy a decir algo que no, no, no debería decirlo y si, y si les, les pido que, que, pues, que no lo vayan a escribir ni lo vayan a contar, no sé, sé que estamos eh, en algo en directo, pero eh, yo no me he querido frustrar y yo eh, me le escapo a mi esquema de seguridad porque tengo que hacer periodismo y un periodismo sin tener a los escoltas encima. Porque, porque tiene que ser un periodismo libre de la presión del Estado o de los ojos eh, de la gente, de la policía, que es la que me cuida. Entonces, eh, yo sé que cometo imprudencias con mi seguridad, pero las asumo. Y, y, y tengo que hacerlo, porque de lo contrario pues no valdría la pena estar en Colombia. Right. Um, I'm going to say something that I shouldn't really say. And please don't write it down. Please don't put it on record, even though I, I know that we're going out live here. So, um, but I do what I can to escape my security detail. I have to work as a, as a journalist. And to do that, um, I, can't, I can't do it with my security. I can't be an independent journalist if I'm being watched by eyes of the state, if I'm being watched by the police, who are the people who make up my, my security detail. So even though I shouldn't, I escape my, my security from, from time to time. I know it's um, injudicious of me, but I do so, and I assume the risks. Was your initial kidnap in the prison sanctioned by the authorities? I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it was, uh, it was the prison authorities and the paramilitaries doing it together. I mean, they didn't do it without Casillarias cooperation. Sí, mi, mi caso es complejo porque, porque en el primer secuestro eh, hay implicados militares, policías, paramilitares y agentes de las cárceles. En el segundo secuestro, están, bueno, lo hicieron las FARC, pero además años después las FARC le pusieron precio a mi cabeza. Eh, entonces hoy decía que, que no sé para dónde mirar porque... Eh, pues porque a todos les caigo mal es un poco complicado sí. eh, y es difícil a la vez porque no se puede confiar en nadie y, y, y precisamente eh, por eso tengo que tomar eh, a veces unos riesgos para poder hacer mis investigaciones y, y el segundo secuestro fue producto de eso porque yo eh, dejé mi esquema de seguridad y viajé sola a esta zona y pues la guerrilla me secuestró. Yeah, it's it's complicated because the first kidnapping um, implicated in it are members of the of the army, members of the police, paramilitaries, and also the the prison authorities. 
And in the second one, well, I was kidnapped by the FARC, but then a few years after the, the kidnapping, they, they put, a, put a price on my head. So in Colombia, everywhere I look, um, I see people who hate me. I'm an enemy to, to many, many people. Um, and it's hard, it's difficult to trust anyone, to tell you the truth. And of course this adds to the risks of the investigations. And since the second kidnapping um, did, in, did occur because I had left my security detail behind. Um, it was the result of that. You spoke about impunity for um, rape and violence against women in the context of the peace process. And I wanted to ask a question about the International Criminal Court. As a result of the systematic use of rape in Bosnia, um, it's now clear that uh, rape is a weapon of war, is a crime against humanity. And the International Criminal Court has been watching Colombia now for two or three years to see whether the government is willing to prosecute international crimes. If there were impunity in the way you suggest in the context of this process, is it realistic to hope that the International Criminal Court would see this as something that it had to address? Esa es nuestra gran esperanza, la Corte Penal Internacional, porque en Colombia solamente hay un caso de violencia sexual que ha sido declarado como crimen de lesa humanidad y es el mío. Y aún así no ha habido voluntad ni del gobierno ni del Estado para castigar a los responsables de mi secuestro. Y a través de este trabajo que hemos hecho en los últimos años, logramos que este año la Corte Penal Internacional en su informe de, de inicio de año mencionara la grave preocupación que tenía sobre la situación de violencia sexual en Colombia. Así que para nosotras, eh, las mujeres que hemos sido víctimas de violencia sexual, creemos que esa es una esperanza de justicia, porque muy seguramente en Colombia no vamos a tener justicia por, eh, por lo que nos hicieron. Right. Well, our big hope is the International Criminal Court. Um, in Colombia, there's only one case of sexual violence that has been recognized as a crime against humanity, and that's my case. But even in that case, there's been no will shown by the government or by the state to punish the perpetrators. Now, this year, um, the start of the year, the ICC published um, its f uh, f start of year um, report where it expressed its serious concern for the systematic use of sexual violence um, in Colombia. And so it is our hope as survivors of, of sexual violence that with the pressures and the actions of the, of the International Criminal Court that something might be done about sexual violence in Colombia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you say that you've been here on a, on a mission to really drum up support for, um, for influencing the peace process in terms of the gender issue and um, violation of women. What's been the reaction here and what um, do you feel you're leaving with some sense of confidence that you will get support from, from the UK and other countries that you've visited? Bueno, yo eh, guardé silencio sobre mi caso y, y no quise hablar nunca eh, sobre lo que había ocurrido. Y precisamente cuando las organizaciones de mujeres empiezan a hacer el estudio de cuál es el impacto de la violencia sexual, es cuando yo decido hablar y convertirme en la voz. Estoy totalmente convencido de que ha ayudado, de que ha tenido un positivo efecto. Específicamente en esta trip, um, we found that members of parliament and, and politicians really didn't have an understanding of the, the scale and nature of the, the problem. And when they heard um, our testimonies and read the report, they were saying that we must act. And so for me, this has been a very positive trip. And I do think that we are going to be able to exert a certain amount of influence on the negotiations in Havana and also um, on the Colombian government and the state in order to act against sexual violence. Y, y, y quiero agregar algo en, en un minuto. Eh, 
Yo creo que además esa incidencia y, y ese trabajo no solamente ha, ha sido eh, eh, con organizaciones de otros países, sino lo que podemos generar dentro de Colombia. Y este año eh, yo decidí tocar eh, la puerta del fútbol colombiano, porque, porque creo que hay que involucrar a los hombres en la solución. Ese no es un problema de nosotras, no es un problema de un grupo de mujeres que fueron abusadas. Los hombres también tienen que estar ahí metidos. Y creí que la mejor forma de llegarle a los hombres era a través del fútbol, eh, que los hace reaccionar eh, o que no los hace reaccionar eh, porque se quedan frente al televisor pasmados. Pero decidí tocar esa puerta y afortunadamente logré que la Federación Colombiana de Fútbol firmara un acuerdo conmigo y con Naciones Unidas, bueno, con Naciones Unidas y conmigo, eh, y lo firmamos hace dos semanas. Y como antesala al Mundial de Fútbol, el fútbol colombiano le va a decir a los hombres colombianos que tienen que frenar la violencia contra la mujer. Entonces yo creo que, que, que son acciones que van saliendo y, y, y que son necesario asumirlas y liderarlas. Eh, entonces no es solamente la parte política, es también de crear conciencia en, en la gente para que realmente esto, esto tenga la importancia que, que tiene. Just let me say one last thing on this. Um, I think that the that we talk about the international work and working with organizations to advocate on on the question on sexual violence, sexual violence, but there's also work to be done um, in Colombia. It's very important that we work in Colombia. And just this year, um, I decided that I would knock on the doors of Colombian football because it's very important to include men. It's not just a problem of women who have been violated, who have been victims of sexual violence, but it's a problem of, that involves men, fundamentally. And in my opinion, the best way to reach men is through football, because that's what they really um, react to, or don't react, because they're sitting there semi-dazed in front of the telly. Um, and so what we want is for Colombian football to speak to men. And last week, just two weeks ago actually, um, I signed an agreement between the Colombian Football Federation and the United Nations, and Um, which in the lead up to the World Cup has agreed that the Colombian Football Federation will um, get the footballers, will get footballers to speak to the population calling for um, an end to violence against women. And we believe that this kind of process is very important and will lead to increased levels of understanding um, of the, the problem of violence against women in our, in our country, in Colombia. And they, they have very qualified. important. They have qualified. qualified. Uh, they have indeed. You see, I think we can. Yes. On that note. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's no, there's no signing, signing up. Um, you can also play a resume. I think we get, get this lady a drink. Look, uh, it's huge. It's let it be. Let it be loud. And let not the suits in the Foreign Office at the United Nations and the rest of them sort of zip up their file, smile politely at Jeanette and get on with the next thing. Um, there's a report by AB, no, no, it's AB Colombia, ABC Colombia. But it, um, if you are really broke or very mean, then please take one and disseminate it. Otherwise, please do leave some money for AB Colombia, not least for getting Jeanette here today. That's a long way. A humbling honor to have you. Thanks to James and thanks to you from the heart and from all of us. A ustedes, a ustedes, gracias por escucharnos. To you, thank you. Thank you for listening to me.